record now. Starting now, we're recording. Um, the point here is we paint whatever, whoever is in charge, um, the sort of people that lost out are painting um, whatever happened as a disaster, right? So we lead to reevaluation. So I'm going to call this step five. The Brian McKnight rule. Does anybody know who Brian McKnight is? This is the most important part of this class. Does anybody know who Brian McKnight is? You guys are all so young, it's gross. Anybody know who Brian McKnight is? It's so important. Guys, I need you to go back to 1998, which is probably before you're born. Uh, and I need to, you guys to picture me in junior high. And the cool thing to do is to go to the local skating rink with our roller skates and we skate around um, and just the spiciest uh, 1990s R&B is playing, right? Does that help? You guys know who Brian McKnight is. It's still just too far before your time. I mean, I just looked it up and he's kind of, He's in the music a lot. He's got singer, songwriter, actor, producer, host, uh, instrumentalist. Do you know his most famous song? No. Uh, anybody know his most famous song? This is too long of a lead up for 0.5 right here. But he, he does. Um, frick, now I've forgotten it. Um, Somebody help me out. What is it? One last cry. Back no, at, back well, at one. Yeah, back, at, back one. at one. How does yeah, that so go? I just seen. I have no idea. Okay. Let me find the chorus. Okay. One, you're like a dream come true. Two, just want to be with you. Three, girl, it's plain to see that you're the only one for me. Four, repeat steps one through three and five, make you fall in love with me. If ever I believe my work is done, then I start back at one, right? And so that's the Brian McKnight rule is once we've completed this policy process, just like a spicy 1990s R&B song, we start back at one, right? We say, oh my gosh, the, pol the chosen policy has been a disaster. We have to, um, we have to study this. We have to care about this. Um, we go back to the issue emerging. Um, opinions continue or, or are pol polarized maybe in a different way. And then we've got alternative policy proposals that happen. Um, either a new policy is enacted or it stays in place. And we're constantly on this Brian McKnight um, roller skating rink 1990s cycle. Does that make sense? OK, so that's one view, and this is the predominant view of how the policy process works. Let me give you a different one. Okay, so I told you two stories of, of uh, COVID, right? I told you the story of me who freaked out and thought it was a zombie apocalypse. I told you the story of my buddy who said, you're overreacting. This is just um, the flu and the government is making the wrong decisions. There is a sort of third camp here, which says you guys are both wrong. Uh, and this camp is called the Kings uh, and Kingmakers camp. And so to explain what this is, I need to know if anybody has watched Game of Thrones. Riley says yes. Okay, Riley. Okay, and Lara. Okay, guys, I need you to go back to season one of Game of Thrones and where with Sean Bean, what's his name in the in the show? What are you talking about? Ned Stark? Ned Stark, right? We start with Ned Stark in season one, and he is the he's the leader at Winterfell. Uh and his buddy, Robert Baratheon, who is the king uh, of all of Westeros, shows up and he says, Ned, I need you to help me. I need you to come to the capital with me. And so Ned goes to the capital uh, with Robert Baratheon. And if you don't know what Game of Thrones, I promise this will all make sense in just a second. But so Ned Stark goes to, um, to Knight's Landing, King's Landing, whatever the capital, King's Landing, King's Landing thank you, goes to the capital. Uh, to try to help uh, Robert Baratheon, his buddy, who is the king. 
And then Ned Stark goes into this room and seated around this room are um, a guy named Littlefinger, um, a woman named Cersei, uh, who is the wife of, of uh, the king, and uh, a man named Varys, I think. What happens at that? What happens at that table? It's the small council meeting, and they make decisions. Oh my gosh! All of a sudden, Ned Stark, this guy who's buddies with Robert Baratheon, has traveled to the capital, and he realizes that it's not Robert Baratheon who's in charge, right? It's not the king that's in charge. It's this council of shadowy individuals who sit in a smoke-filled room and they are like puppet masters controlling sort of the decisions that the king makes and secretly running the kingdom, right? So that's the story uh, in Gang of Thrones is that there's these shadowy individuals who are really responsible for all of the decisions, um, all of the policy decisions in um, Westeros, which is that sort of world. There is a, there is a substantial but minority view uh, in, in America today that this is how America works, right? That there is this secret um, master puppeteers behind the scenes pulling the strings for um, the policy decisions that get, that get made, right? So, so this story that we just told here the Brian McKnight rules of the policy process, the people who um, subscribe to this kings and kingmakers view would say no. All of these steps that you just said, these are all a facade. These are all a charade. And actually, it's this small group of powerful people who are running the, running the show um, to control sort of everything uh, that goes on, right? So this is a minority view. Um, it's not the view that I uh, subscribe to, but certainly, so somebody tell me that story uh, in the context of coronavirus. Somebody who's friends with any of my Facebook friends, tell me that story uh, in the context of coronavirus. Which side of it? The like, it's all a hoax. The kings or, and kingmakers, that... exactly. The shadowy individuals. Tell me that. Give me that metaphor uh, in coronavirus. Well, it's all made up, you know. In in this in this metaphor, of course, you know, like the government, they're putting tracking systems in the vaccine, yada yada yada. Exactly. They can, Beautiful. You know, control people. Exactly. Or do that. Or maybe that that. Um, early in the pandemic, maybe it was, we said, maybe this was all Bill Gates, right? That had secretly released this thing and then Microsoft was gonna invent this vaccine just to make them um, rich, right? So there is this, this uh, major share uh, of the population that, that ascribes to this kings and kingmakers uh, view. I can't disprove it, right? Uh, it, but I, I don't ascribe to it, okay? Let's carry on with the sort of more popular view, uh, which is that this policy process is actually an informative process uh, that works. Then let me push back one more time, right? So su suppose you um, are of the belief that that policy process sort of follows the Brian McKnight steps. Let me give you a counter argument here, um, which is, does anybody know what share of the population um, farmers represent in the US? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. Farmers are less than 1% uh, of the US population. And yet, we are extremely successful uh, in achieving favorable legislation, uh, legislation that's favorable to agriculture. Why? If that's true, and the policy process sort of plays out with majority rule, how can that be true? Because we produce something that everyone needs. Okay, 
Um, or farmers produce something. There, there are a lot of jobs uh, tied to agriculture that are not necessarily farm jobs. Um, yeah, and food security and safety. Ooh, okay, so food security and safety. So what you're telling me right there, Ashley, um, is a different group of constituents than agriculture, right? So you're, you guys are both exactly right that one of the reasons that we have been so successful uh, in agriculture is that we are very um, strategic in forming coalitions with allied um, industry coalitions, right? So if we've got, if we are agriculture and we care about the interests of agriculture and down the down the street uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, DC, there are the lobbyists for the nutrition food security people. Our agriculture lobby and that food security um, lobby can get together and say, hey, if we work together, uh, we can, um, we can lobby for something that's sort of mutually beneficial. And in doing so, we've increased the mass uh, of our sort of stakeholder groups, right? So let's do building coalitions. And actually, it's not just um, the kind of nutrition food security people that we have built coalitions with. What are some of the other groups that we've been really successful at building coalitions with? What's the big sort of, we've got a farm bill coming up, the 2023 farm bill. What is the big theme of the 2023 farm bill? Uh, the food stamps, well. Okay, yeah, yeah. So and, and so that's still, Lara, in the camp of that food security nutrition stuff, right? Uh, you're right that that's a major theme of every farm bill. Uh, is there anything else that we're focusing on or thinking is, are likely to be focused on in this upcoming farm bill? So environment and conservation, right? The, the fact that for the first time or, or um, in a major way, we're expecting that um, agriculture is going to be pulled into those climate sustainability talks, right? So in addition to coalitions with the food security nutrition programs, we've also aligned ourselves um, with the environment conservation uh, lobby uh, to find ways that we can be mutually beneficial. Anything else? So in the 2008 Farm Bill, the 2012 Farm Bills, we were really focused on uh, energy sustainability, right? So the Renewable Fuel Standard, we aligned ourselves um, with sort of the Energy Coalition. There are several different, so we've also got the Rural, rural Development Coalition that we've aligned ourselves with, okay? Uh, so are there reasons other than that that we're really good and strategic about building those coalitions? I'll give you another one. Ugh, sorry, that's more serial killer writing. Um, so we are fairly lucky uh, in our industry because most of the things we produce uh, are commodities with markets. Um, and that lends itself to advocacy because we can prov we can take um, policy positions based on economic facts, right? So we can say, if you do this, our stakeholders will gain by X billion or X million dollars. And that dollar value is something that's really, really easy for a policymaker to digest because they're setting their budgets 
based on monetary values, right? So we can sort of say an apples to apples comparison there by giving them uh, numbers. So if you look at the American Farm Bureau, um, they used to have a chief economist named John Newton, who's since gone on to work for somebody at Congress, but he had the best sort of infographics, um, which would show you the point of the policy and the economic uh, value to be gained by policy. So you could look up John Newton, American Farm Bureau to see sort of what I'm talking about there. Anything else? I think it might've been either Grace or Lara or Ashley hinted at this one uh, a second ago in a way that Historically speaking, and I think in the minds of most Americans, agriculture is different than other industries, right? We have this sort of historical connection to agriculture. I'm not a farmer, right? But people um, one generation or two generations back were farmers. So we have, uh, and, and probably that holds true for a lot of you, uh, it certainly holds true for a lot of the broader population that even if you look today at the demographics, if you go back a couple of generations, we as a nation were much more connected to the land. And actually, um, if you look at Thomas Jefferson's sort of vision for um, the United States, he had this thing called the agrarian ideal, which was a nation built on small farms, right? So we have this historical perceptions of agriculture being of moral value, right? So we have, um, just like a historical love of the industry. And there are, there are more, but I think we've beat this, over the, uh, beat this over the head for long enough. Okay, so this is the reason, these are the reasons um, that historically um, agriculture, the agricultural industry has been really successful uh, in terms of gaining favorable policies. I think that that will continue in the future, but there is a risk here in that agriculture for a very, very long time has been a politically neutral subject. But since I guess 20, late 2018, early 2019, um, under the Trump administration, we increased the subsidies um, to agricultural, uh, to agriculture dramatically, higher than they'd ever been. Um, and in doing so, my worry is that we will start to take partisan sides with respect to agriculture, that agriculture um, will be the industry favored by the right, uh, whereas um, there will be sort of less vested interest in agriculture uh, from the left. And if that happens, if agriculture takes, um, is part of this political divide, which we have now, uh, which we haven't seen uh, in my lifetime, right? We hate each other more now than we have for all of my life. If agriculture gets caught up in that, all of a sudden this favorable policy positions um, that we benefit from in agriculture uh, will get a lot harder to attain. Does that make sense? Oh, thoughts on that? I'm interested to hear you guys' thoughts on that. I know you are young relative to me. You made that clear with your um, refusal to know who Brian McKnight was, which I am deeply offended by. But do you guys have some sort of thoughts on, Lara, I saw you unmuted yourself. Do you guys have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I do have thoughts on it. I have thoughts on everything, but. <laughs> okay. Um, how about on this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree with you. But at the same time, it's interesting because like whenever I look at it, I think I've only paid attention to like policies within agriculture and the partisanship that exists in that since the Trump administration. So in a way, like this generation that's like going through college, recently graduated, what have you, like that's all they're going to know. Sure, absolutely. Uh, no, but, but I'm with you in that it's... Um, it's all scary because ag affects everyone and there's no reason for it to be partisan, but you do see it leaning that way. Okay, great. So you, you sort of agree with me that maybe in this recent past, we have seen some partisanship with respect to 
perceptions of agriculture. Anybody else have thoughts here? Or Lara, you were gonna say something else. No. Well, part of it is agriculture. A huge part of it is middle America, which is very much associated Absolutely. with yep. the red states. Um, even though California agriculture is huge, they don't necessarily, you know, they're buying all the, raising all the fruits and vegetables and sometimes they get overlooked versus the corn and soybean guys, so. And that's true actually in the uh, payouts, right? The, yeah. the ad hoc payouts that happened under the uh, Trump administration, right? That, that those industry groups, with the exception of dairy, those industry groups in California were sort of largely overlooked in that too. Yeah, fair enough. Other, other comments, points? I think a big part of it has to do with, um, with, you know, this divide that we have for agriculture has to do with a lack of education of agriculture in general. I mean, what Ashley mentioned earlier that the people in the Midwest have a good education about agriculture because they came from that background in a rural environment, whereas those people on the coast uh, don't have much of an education about it. And they see stuff on social media and et cetera. And then that kind of sparks all this policy um, ranting and whatnot that people have towards the agriculture industry and changes in it. Uh, we've seen that over the years, especially as someone who's a big livestock advocate. Um, Colorado has been one of the largest changing states Fast. in the US. Yeah, absolutely. Um, within especially beef production. Um, it's kind of um, mesmerizing uh, in a bad way of how uh, it's changed within a course of 30 years, even 20 years. So those are some big key facts in it. Jack, so I think the the story of Colorado uh, and the the sort of its history as a livestock um, mecca, uh, and to see the changing demographics of the Colorado population, uh, and then some of the policy proposals which have been enacted uh, in Colorado would make for a super spicy sort of end of year debate. So if if Colorado and some of those animal welfare uh, laws or something you're interested in, um, let's get you a group uh, and then we'll find a group on the other side and we can hash that one out because I think that is that is so, so interesting to see. I think that'd be a good one too. Cool. Other points here, are you guys ready to move on? All right, let's move on. Okay, so if you don't, um, by sort of that kings and king makers uh, and the shadow puppets uh, argument, then tell me, can you explain to me from a political economy's perspective, what is the role uh, of the farm lobby, uh, of farm lobbyists or of lobbyists in general? Well, lobbyists are usually hired by like uh, commodity-based groups or other groups that are involved in the agriculture industry to kind of help promote and push uh, different legislation that they want to go into to effect. I know when I was an intern with the Missouri Cattlemen Association, we had uh, two lobbyists and they were uh, working in the Capitol nonstop, meeting with senators and uh, representatives to kind of help push for what we want uh, to see within uh, different types of bills and et cetera. Okay, so Jackie, yeah, I, th I think that was beautiful, especially the point where you said what we want, right? So we've got the Congress uh, person right here, and then that Congress person, uh, in theory, is supposed to be um, a representative on behalf of his stakeholders, right? So we've got a whole bunch of people who are the stakeholders for this Congress person. If we didn't have, those are all supposed to be humans. If we didn't have um, the lobby, we would get these people emailing Congress, right? And every one of them have 10,000 requests. If instead we put in, I'm going to try to draw a funnel. This is a funnel. Everyone sees it and sees a funnel. Okay. So this is a funnel. And here's the lobbyist. 
So they can take all of those disparate messages uh, about agriculture from these constituents and they can funnel it into sort of a concise, um, a concise story or a concise request of these are the problems we see and these are the solutions, then it's a much more efficient activity. If these lobbyists serve as a filter or a funnel information to sort of distill this broad group of requests or problems into one sort of filtered piece of information for Congress, then we have a much more efficient policy process. Right, so that is one way to see the role uh, of these lobby groups. Okay, so this is this is the argument of the of the position that I uh, subscribe to. Right, that there is this political economy of the farm lobby, but there's a counter argument, right? And that counter argument is, well, if you look at the farm bill and you look at the things that get negotiated, a lot of that stuff has been word for word written by these farm lobbyists. How can we say that this is sort of a fair political process and not somebody pulling these puppet master strings if these lobbyists are actually writing the words that become law? Can you guys sort of reconcile that for me? Could you repeat that? <laughs> yes, okay, so. We've got the congressperson and they're um, trying to introduce or support uh, bills, right? And I said to you, well, in this process of figuring out what laws need to be made, the lobbyist serves as this really efficient filter uh, of information to get to that congressperson so he can decide what bills to introduce or what bills to support. A counter argument to that is, if you look at legislation affecting agriculture in the US, if you look at farm bills of the past, major swaths of that text have been word for word written by these lobby groups. Tell me how, if these lobbyists, these lobby groups are writing the text of these bills, how is that not the textbook example of these master puppeteers um, sending us this information? Because the people in Congress at the end of the day have so much to think about and work on, they're not, they, they don't have time to write up a, I don't know, 500 page farm bill or whatever. They just read it and approve it. So or not, they, right? So, so exactly, Ashley. So, so that's, that's sort of the argument against the counter argument, right? That, um, yeah, these farm lobbyists are experts in this industry. Who better to draft proposed bills than the people who are experts in this industry. These farm lobbyists have absolutely zero power to introduce this legislation, to get it ultimately enacted. They can write as many bills as they want till they're blue in the face. It is only the, con the Congress person uh, who can introduce um, a bill to Congress or introduce legislation, right? Does that make sense? So it's, it's, a, it's most efficient to let the people who have a vested interest in this policy draft the proposed bill. And then it is completely 100% up to that congressperson to decide whether they want to introduce that bill for consideration to Congress. Does that make sense? Anybody say that's not a fair representation or I don't buy that? It's it, this is an aside. So I taught this course last semester in in Lansing, Michigan, which is a much um, more politically liberal leaning uh, place just of truth than uh, than Oklahoma State right than Stillwater. And so it's really, really interesting from my perspective to see um, you guys' comments and your reactions than it was to see or versus those reactions and comments um, from some of the students uh, in Michigan. All right, what are we at? Four o'clock, we got 15 more minutes. 
let's just blow through the rest of this stuff. Okay, I'm just a bill. What the heck does that mean? Schoolhouse rock song. Did you just start dancing a little bit when I put that, Lara? <laughs> yeah, I did. I was homeschooled till the third grade, so that's my justification. But you that just danced like to everything? Oh, no, just schoolhouse rock. <laughs> I know, I'm just teasing. Okay, so tell me, what is that schoolhouse rock? What is I'm just a bill? It's a little educational video song about how bills are made. And so tell me the process. Can you just sing the song for us, Lara? And Absolutely do your dance not. that you were just doing, please. <laughs> we're, this is recording and we're all watching. <laughs> yeah, I know. I don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll start that. It's like, I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill. And it talks about how he's introduced uh, into Congress. And then he gets revised. And then he gets a vote on the floor. And then I'm pretty sure he gets revised again. And then he gets another vote on the floor. And finally, he passes through Congress. And then the video, he goes to the president's desk and he sits in a line with a lot of other bills just waiting to be signed. And then he gets a veto at the end and the process starts all over again. So Thank Lara, you. that was uh, a concerningly accurate representation of the Schoolhouse Rock video. Good job. If you, put, if you put on the video, I bet I could sing along. But I wouldn't because it's a recording. But I knew that pretty well. I've been a nerd since I was little. When we when we get in person, Lara, we can put it on and then you can come to the front of the class and you can just <laughs> dance. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's exactly right. Right. So Congress uh, is divided up into two um, houses. There's the House of Representatives and there's the Senate. Right. And in each of these um, bodies of Congress. There are a whole bunch of committees, uh, one of which is the Agriculture Committee. And so only a, only a legislator, a member of either the House or the Senate can introduce um, a bill into Congress, right? So if I'm, a, if I'm a member of the House, I can introduce a bill into the House. If I'm a member of the Senate, I can introduce a, a bill to the Senate. When I introduce that bill, it automatically goes to a committee. So let's talk about those committees. Um, well, yeah. So it can go to the committee and it can go to a committee. We'll talk about those relative relevant committees in just a second, but it can go to a committee in three ways. First, it can just be considered as a standalone bill. Right. And I think that's what the bill in the schoolhouse rock is. Right. It's just one bill in a long line of bills. Uh, it can be that it can be rolled into uh, a set of bills. Right. So that's sort of how the farm bill started getting created. We had a whole bunch of uh, different agriculture legislation uh, in Congress. We decided to put them together as one big body of legislation that ultimately became the farm bill. Right. So it can be rolled into a broader set of bills or third uh, and maybe most disappointingly, it can die without ever being ugh, considered. So those are the three things that happen when it gets sent to the relevant committee. What is the relevant committee? So there are a whole bunch of different committees uh, in the House and the Senate. Both of them have a committee on agriculture. They have committees on foreign affairs. They have uh, committees on ways and means. They have committees till you're blue in the face, right? Suppose you've got a bill that comes in. How do you decide what is the relevant committee? I'm going to not pause because we've got not a lot of time left. So in the Senate, oh, why is my writing not writing? There we go. In the Senate, they look at the bill and they determine the predominant subject. 
They look at the bill and they determine the predominant subject, and then they send it to the most relevant committee. And that committee has the sole sort of jurisdiction over that um, bill. That is not the way it works in the House. In the House, they look at a bill and they look at, they determine what committees have potential interest in this bill and then they send it to all of those committees. Okay, so in uh, the House, there is shared jurisdiction. So if I introduce a bill on agriculture in the Senate, it would go to the Agricultural Committee. In the House, it would go to the Agricultural Committee and the Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Committee on Homeland Security and the Committee on Taxation and the Committee on Energy and the Committee on Natural Resources and several other potential committees, right? Uh, once it's in those committees, it is, um, again, either rolled into uh, a broader set of bills uh, considered as a standalone or dies. If it doesn't die, if it makes it to that next step, it is, uh, like Lara said, it is marked up, it is revised, and then it is voted on in that committee. If it is voted on and they vote to approve that bill in the committee, it gets sent to the broader House if it was in the House committees or the broader Senate if it was in the Senate committees. And then it is voted on again. If it, uh, if it passes that broader vote of the full House or the full Senate, then it goes to the other body of Congress. So if it passed the House, then it gets sent to the Senate and it goes through that same procedure in the Senate. If it passed first in the Senate, then it gets sent to the House, right? It's the same process. It has to be uh, approved uh, by both the House and the Senate. Once a bill, makes its way all the way through the House and all the way from through the Senate, then the bill, the revised text of the bill uh, from the Senate is compared with the revised text from the House. And in order for that thing to be passed, the text has to be identical, which happens approximately 0% of the time, right? They're always marking these things up. If you look at some of the uh, COVID relief bills, they've got markings in the margin, which are illegible. They're never the same. So when they're not the same, the final bill from the House and the Senate, when those things are not the same, the two versions go to a um, subcommittee with members of the House and the Senate, and they sort of negotiate a final version uh, of this bill, which has identical text between the House and the Senate. That final version is sent back to the House and sent back to the Senate, and they have no more opportunity to revise. They can either say, thumbs up, we like this bill, or thumbs down, we don't like this bill. In the event that they say, thumbs up, we like this bill, then just as Lara says, it goes to the president. And the president can either sign it into law or uh, he or she can veto it and it gets sent back to Congress. If it's signed into law, we can talk about that in a second. If it gets vetoed, uh, it's sent back to Congress. Uh, and as Lara said, Congress can override that veto with a two thirds majority. And so, my gosh, that's a horrible story, right? All of these convoluted things that's happening. Um, it's important to know because bills, agricultural bills have gotten hung up uh, in these processes many, many times. For example, the 2008 Farm Bill was vetoed by President George Bush and got sent back to Congress, right? So even in the world of agriculture, which I said historically has been um, sort of unified and nonpartisan, these legislative hoops um, have to be jumped through uh, and, and even, even for agriculture, oftentimes the jumping fails. Suppose a bill
Okay, so I'm just an unfunded mandate. Suppose a bill goes through that process and it gets approved by the House, it gets approved by the Senate, it gets approved by the president and signed into law. That doesn't actually mean it will ever be implemented, right? So um, if we haven't appropriated funding for this thing, even if we have this law, we can't implement it unless we've got money to fund it. So in 2002, we had this um, conservation security program, which was supposed to pay people for conservation. The problem is the, the funding for that conservation security program didn't come through in the 2002 Farm Bill. So we had this um, lofty rule, which was going to pay people to make conservation efforts. And oh, crap, we don't have money to pay people to make these conservation efforts. So we have to have the funding in order to um, carry out these rules. Um, there are two types of funding. There's mandatory funding, which means we go to the treasury and the treasury has to print new money to make these rules. And luckily for agriculture, most of the farm bill falls into this mandatory funding, right? So if it goes through the the process on Capitol Hill and it gets signed into law, if it's a mandatory funding, it will be implemented. Uh, in contrast to mandatory, we've got um, things with discretionary funding. And discretionary funding, um, these are allocated according to those annual budget negotiations, which are usually a disaster uh, and are usually not negotiated until 20 minutes before the deadline. Right. So if we don't get funding in these uh, budget negotiations, the law is never impl implemented. And this happens uh, and it matters. So, for example, when I was uh, finishing up my job, uh, my Ph.D. and I was on the job market, a couple of my friends got jobs uh, at the USDA to be economic researchers at the USDA. This was in 2017. In 2017, we had a massive freeze, a budget freeze. They couldn't successfully negotiate the budget. And as a result, they froze. Uh, my buddies had jobs lined up in the Economic Research Service of the USDA. The funding didn't come through for those jobs. So my buddies who thought they had jobs in Washington, D.C., there was no money to hire them. So they just had to go without jobs. Uh, even though they had been hired by the USDA, they were part of this discretionary funding and the funding didn't come through. So they ended up not getting those jobs. Uh, it's a thing that matters. 415, I've got like two minutes more that we can talk about next time. Does anybody have questions about anything we've covered? All right, well, I'll put these notes uh, up on Canvas and I'll put this recording up on Canvas and I will see you on Thursday. Thank you. Yep. Bye, guys.